To start our second session, our next speaker is the Operations Manager for the U.S. Department of Energy's Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Climate Research Facility. That's a mouthful. The author or co-author of more than 100 research papers, conference proceedings, published reports, and extended abstracts, he's active in educational outreach programs based on weather topics and on problem solving and critical thinking skills. Introducing Doug Sisterson, speaking on the scientific process and how scientists get the right answer. Nice, whoops, I was warning if that was gonna fall. Another nice warm day to talk about global warming. I think uh, the topic here today is that the teaser is global warming, but I think there's a deeper message, and I try to tell you what I mean by that. Global warming, to me, I spent a lot of time doing research in that area, so I understand what all, that all means. But I think for the public, it must be extremely difficult to understand global warming. I mean, it's everywhere. It's in the media. Pick your media choice. You can find an article about global change, climate change, in almost every media that you can think of. It was even part of a presidential platform campaign for this year. So it must be confusing for you because you only get sound bites from the media. And so we can find a climate scientist that will tell you that, yes, climate's the real deal. And, and boy, the apocalypse is coming and it's going to change humanity. But we can change the channel and look at another climate scientist that will tell you, you know, it's just a statistical anomaly. And yet we can change the channel again and maybe go to CNN headlines and find out we had climate gate. That somebody broke into somebody's computer and found some information about climate and suddenly it challenges the scientific process. So from your perspective, it must be extremely difficult to try to figure out global warming. Is it a real deal or just a good story? But first, what I really want to do is talk to you about behind the scenes. Scientists, what do they do? How do scientists do what they do to get the right answer? And even great ideas, they need to be validated. So I'm going to give you some examples of what I think scientists do to get the right answer. And I'm going to go over here and grab this. It's a whip. And it's going to be used as an example. I'm going to crack the whip, and it's going to make a startling sound. And what I really want to know from you is, what do you think makes that sound? Now, I'm from a very safe workplace, and I'm going to have to warn you, it's a startling noise. I don't want to see anybody grabbing their chest, OK? So here we go. It's a whip, and I'm going to make a startling sound. Think about what makes that noise, that cracking noise. Now, if I don't do it right, we don't hear it. If we had time to dialogue with the audience, we would find out that basically the sound that we hear has to do with the motion of the end part of the whip. And I get the whip going fast. Matter of fact, I get it going faster than the speed of sound. And when that happens, sonic boom. OK? So basically, the sound we hear is a sonic boom. I left the clicker over here. So in the next slide, after we have lightning, we get Thunder. Very good. Now, what do you think causes thunder? What was this? A sonic boom. OK. Thunder is a sonic boom as well. But it took meteorologists 200 years to figure out what's going faster than the speed of sound. So what they really found out that basically lightning is electricity passing through the atmosphere. The atmosphere doesn't like that, so it puts up resistance. Resistance generates heat. Heat generates light, voila, you have a lightning flash. But in that heat part of it, it's a channel about six inches in diameter, and the temperature in the core of that channel gets to be 30,000 degrees centigrade. It happens over you know, millions of a second. But think about it. When you heat air, what happens? It expands. And what happens if it expands at a rate that's faster than the speed of sound? You get a sonic boom. You get a really good one, because unlike my whip, that was only about two inches going faster than the speed of sound, a lightning channel can be anywhere from one to 100 miles long. And it's very impressive. Now, that was a long way around the block to get you to the point of the first example of what scientists do. They take something they know, and they apply it to something they don't know. Sonic boom. I'm an expert in sonic boom. I'm going to look for a problem that has sound. Now, this next example 
is a little bit more interesting. You probably didn't figure you would have a quiz this afternoon. But what I want to know is how much dirt is there in a hole that's 36 inches by 1 foot by 12 inches? Now, I'll help you through this. It's a volume problem, so we know it's going to have to be in cubic something. And cubic inches is a little tough to figure out, but we can put it all in units of feet. And I can get 3 times 1 times 1, or 3 cubic feet. Right? Wrong. Very good. There is no dirt in a hole. I'll give you a few of you a minute to think about that. But what's important about this is that it's a really good example of what scientists do. Not all of the information they get from their experiments is useful to solving their problem. Think about that. So scientists, boy, we're, we're, we're a really perky bunch. We futz over every single data point that we get from an experiment. We're not allowed to throw them out, and we have to make sure that we understand them. And when it's a scatter plot, we want to draw a line through there, and by golly, it's really tough to adjust that with some certainty if it looks like a scatter plot. So scientists learn to ask good questions. They're detectives. And if you ask a good question, you get a better return on your investment. You don't get so many ambiguous data points that really isn't information. That is data helping you solve your problem. The third example is probably the, the most sacred of all things for a scientist. How do scientists get the right answer? Believe it or not, science is social. Even though scientists mumble and talk to their feet, it's highly social. We can communicate through conference proceedings and through publications. And I wish that when I graduated from graduate school that the dean would, would you know, palm the key to the book of all knowledge in my hand and teach me the secret handshake that I could go to the library so I could go in the back room and open up the book of all knowledge and find the right answer for the cure for cancer or the cure for global warming or the cure for economics. It doesn't work that way. So science has to take another route. Science is actually very democratic. So science is by consensus. What does that mean? Poetically, it means that if I can get one more than half of my distinguished colleagues to believe my set of explanation of stuff, then it becomes Doug's theory. We put it in the book and we teach it as the right answer. Now, that sounds simple, but there are a few challenges along the way. Something else to wrap your brain around. Generally, theories cannot directly be proven to be right. Theories exist because you can't prove them wrong. And that's why it takes science a long time. Because there's no, I got a theory, I can prove it right, done. Theories exist because you can't prove them wrong. So how do we finally get consensus? How do we know when we're going to get the right answer? Well, science is very careful to follow its golden rule, and it's a scientific process or the scientific method. And basically, I wish it was in better focus, but it basically on the left side it says, you know what, you ask a question, you do some background search, you come up with a hypothesis, and a hypothesis something is not a tested theory, it's just a, gee, I think it's this. And you go out and you get the data, and you try to analyze the data, and then you come up to a conclusion based on your information. Now, it can not only be your information, but it could be somebody else's data or somebody else's hypothesis you want to test. But the key point about this is science is not about the outcome. It's about the process. We hold to the items on the left and let the chips fall where they may. The second thing is, you know what? It's OK to be wrong. In the very first slide, I showed Madame Curie and Albert Einstein. And Einstein had a quote that basically said something like, you know what? You're a genius. And a genius is a person that only comes up with one good idea in their lifetime. What does that mean, a good idea? What I think Einstein meant is that he came up with a hypothesis that nobody could prove wrong. And there's very few scientists in the world that can come up with the first thought of the right answer. So science really is about failure in a way. It's about learning what things aren't. But you know what? Our process is OK with that. We can publish papers and get consensus about what we're wrong about. Because by knowing what something isn't, we're getting closer to understand what something is. And finally, the last, the last point up here, just to make it more interesting, is consensus always right. 
You can probably think of some examples where consensus hasn't been correct. The favorite one I remember is when I was in elementary school, we memorized facts. And so in 1492, I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So if we were students in a classroom, a science classroom back in 1491, and, we, and the teacher asked us, is the world flat or is it round? If we want to get a good grade in that class, the right answer is in 1491, the world is flat, dude. Everybody knows if you sail off to the horizon, you're going to fall off the edge of the earth. But something came along. Something came along, whether it was technology or a different viewpoint that was impassioned by somebody to relook at the data and re-examine the problem. And so that changed consensus because there was something new that hadn't been considered. So consensus can change. But I will tell you that consensus right now, that it may not be the best answer, but it's the best answer we have on the available information that we have. So now we can go back to climate change. Basically, at the highest level, we can look at, at the globe, the Earth, and we get all of our sun or heat energy from the sun. So it's a two-step process. The Earth is heated by the sun's radiant energy, and at nighttime when the sun goes down, the energy is released back to space. But the really interesting fact here is that if our atmosphere is what we call completely transparent, if there are no greenhouse gases, it would radiate all of the heat that it got during the day and lose it at night. And the temperature of the Earth in equilibrium would be zero degrees Fahrenheit. That's a pretty cold planet. But the fact that we have greenhouse gases, natural greenhouse gases, that have been around for millions of years, Equilibrium with the, with the greenhouse gases allows us to be at a balmy 59, 60 degrees Fahrenheit as a global average. But I would point to the fact to you that only 0.05% of the Earth's atmosphere by mass is made up of greenhouse gases. And 80% of those is represented by carbon dioxide. The point that should strike you is that, my goodness, a very small amount of carbon dioxide is present in our atmosphere but it has a huge effect on the comfort level of the planet we live. And so this is why we have consensus on global warming. It's because we've been able, over the last 20, 30 years, come to consensus that we know that we're burning carbon dioxide. We know there's natural amounts of carbon dioxide. The hard part was trying, being able to distinguish between human-made and natural. We can do that now. And what we're learning is that, unlike other parts of our climate where there was maybe a comet hit the Earth and there was a fire, or maybe when plate tectonics crashed and it released CO2 and other examples, those were just a one-time perturbation to the climate, and then it averaged out. What we're doing now by burning fossil fuels is we're continuously increasing the amount of greenhouse gases, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So global warming isn't the fact that the daytime highs are going to get higher. It's the fact that the nighttime lows aren't getting as cold. So when we look at all of this, you say, well, you know, is it industry? Who's, do, who's doing all this? You know, I'm, I'm not going to try to hear and, and sell on a philosophy, but I'll give you a, sort of an idea to understand where we fit in all this, kind of give you a, an order of magnitude kind of thing. And the order of magnitude thing I could give you is that for every gallon of gasoline that you burn in your car or your lawnmower, you put 17 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. More cars, more carbon dioxide. The problem is this is a bias to climate change, not a one-time perturbation. So scientific consensus, there's little doubt. And I will tell you that um, our colleagues would, would tell you that it's almost impossible to argue against the fact that with increasing greenhouse gases due to combustion of, of uh, carbon dioxide or carbon-based fuels, there's little doubt that our planet is warming. But we don't live in average. We live in Naperville. We live in Homer Glen. We live wherever we live. And so climate is going to have an impact on the weather. And it's going to have an impact on the weather where we live. And yeah, I care about global warming, but I like to know what's going to happen right here where I live. How will climate change affect me? And the fact is, we don't know yet. It's an extremely complex problem. And we just got consensus on the fact that it's warming because of greenhouse gases. So 
hopefully, it, I only have a few minutes to give you climate change, but I think what listening to the earlier speakers today, that it's pretty interesting that the scientific process, you know, when you're looking at information and you're trying to figure out what's real, what's not, maybe in your mind now you'll be thinking about, you know what, what's the consensus opinion? It may not be the most popular one, it may not be the one that catches the most bite lines on the media. It's kind of boring, but you know what? It's probably the closest one to the right answer. Thank you.